Well, we've done one atom, and we've done two atoms, so now it's time to do three or more atoms. So let's take a look at polyatomic molecules. And in addition to the usual translational and electronic degrees of freedom, a polyatomic molecule can also rotate, as a diatomic can, but it also has multiple vibrations. That distinguishes it from a diatomic, which has a single vibration. Nevertheless, the total polyatomic energy is the sum of the same four components as for a diatomic, translational, rotational, vibrational, electronic. And just as for the other two cases we've done so far, the translational is determined from solving the particle in a box, Schrodinger equation. That only depends on the mass of the particle, not how many atoms contribute to that mass. So we get a uh, partition function and an energy that is entirely equivalent to what we've seen before. And also, as for a diatomic gas, when it comes to the electronic energy, we assign the ground state energy value. Remember, in the diatomic, it was the dissociation energy, or actually the negative of the dissociation energy, assigned as the bottom of the energy well, the ground state. So in a polyatomic, it's the same idea, but because there are multiple bonds that can dissociate, it's the sum of all the dissociation energies. As for the rotations, this is a little bit different. So one case is not all that different. If our polyatomic molecule remains linear, as a diatomic must be with only two atoms, then in fact you get the same solution to the rigid rotator equation. The only difference is, of course, that the moment of inertia has to be determined for all of the atoms in the molecule, not just for two atoms. But in any case, you get the same rotational partition function. It's T over the rotational temperature, and the symmetry number appears. And once again, the symmetry number tells you essentially if I rotate at end over end a half a rotation, will I get something indistinguishable from what I started with? That would be carbon dioxide, for example. If that's the case, then the symmetry number is 2. If, on the other hand, I have to proceed with an entire rotation to get back where I started, then the symmetry number is 1. And that might be uh, replacing one of the oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide with a sulfur atom, which is carbonyl sulfide, incidentally, as if you want to do a little chemical nomenclature. Now, for nonlinear polyatomics, uh, the situation is a bit more complicated. And once we have uh, atoms in space that are not aligned in a, a single line, there will be three unique moments of inertia. And you can think of those as being aligned on Cartesian axes, if you like. There's an IX, an IY, and an IZ. Or maybe we should give them different uh, labels. We'll call them IA, IB, and IC. And given that there are three of them, there are sort of three possibilities. Either they're all equal to one another. So when that happens, we uh, have equivalent rotational temperatures. So if the moments of inertia are the same, the rotational temperatures are the same. And the name for that is a spherical top. Obviously, the next possible case is that two of them are the same and one of them is different. And that, too, has a special name that's known as a symmetric top. And finally, the last case is that none of them are equal one to another in which case they all have different moments of inertia, different rotational temperatures, and that is called an asymmetric top. It might seem a little odd we call it a top when all three are different. Nevertheless, that's the name in rotational spectroscopy. And so if we look at the partition functions for these systems, I'm not going to derive them. It's a bit more complicated due to the quantum mechanics. But for the spherical top, for example, I'll present you the result, it actually looks pretty similar in terms of energy levels. What's changed here is, notice the degeneracy is no longer uh, 2j plus 1. It's actually 2j plus 1 squared. So the degeneracies are going up more rapidly. And there are characteristic expressions for the other tops as well. So in all cases, of course, the rotational partition function can be written in a general way. And it will still be the case that as long as the rotational temperature associated with each moment of inertia is well below the temperature at which we're working, we can replace these sums with integrals and solve the integrals. And when you do that, the solutions you end up with are shown here. So for the spherical top, we've got something that looks reasonably familiar. It's something that dropped out of the diatomic temperature divided by rotational temperature but now raised to the 3 halves power, and appearing out front a pi to the 1 half, and our symmetry number is still there. And in this case, the symmetry number may take on values other than 1 or 2, uh, and it just depends on the nature of the molecule. A symmetric top has 
a T over theta rotation for the two rotational temperatures that are equal to one another, because the moments of inertia are equal to one another. And that's raised to the first power, we might say. And then there's a 1 half power for T over the other rotational temperature. And again, a pi to the 1 half power out front. And finally, in the asymmetric top, there is this expression, T cubed, all the product of all the rotational temperatures, all to the uh, 1 half power, if you will. So I'm just going to put that on another slide to continue to work with it. If these are the partition functions, and this is the ensemble partition function associated with these products, note that all of these have 3 halves temperature, a power dependence on the temperature of 3 halves, that is. And so if we carry out the partial differentiation of the log of the partition function, that 3 halves, so here it's a 1 plus a half is 3 halves. Here it's t cubed to the 1 half, it's 3 halves. Here it's just explicitly 3 halves. So when I take the log of these partition functions, which is what I do when I compute internal energy, the 3 halves will come down as a multiplier because it's the exponent on something I'm taking the log of. So I'll end up with a 3 halves log t with respect to t. So that'll be 3 halves times 1 over t. That 1 over t will cancel one of the t's and the t squared, and I'll end up with 3 halves rt. That's the contribution to the internal energy of the rotations in a polyatomic that's not linear. And for the heat capacity, I just have to take the derivative of the internal energy with respect to temperature, I get 3 halves r. And again, this is consistent then with the way we thought about what happened in a diatomic. In a diatomic, there were two unique ways to rotate. You can't rotate about your diatomic axis, but we said each of those two ways to rotate contributes one half r. So when we're no longer linear, there are in fact three ways to rotate about each of the unique axes, if you will. Each of them contributes one half r, and so the total now is three halves r instead of two halves r, or just r. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, let's pause for a moment and I'll uh, let you uh, play with those concepts a bit and we'll come back. All right, so that takes care of rotations and I. I think you appreciate now the difference between a linear molecule and a nonlinear molecule in terms of how those differing degrees of freedom contribute to the heat capacity and to the molar internal energy. Next, let's uh, put together some of the other components and work with the full partition function and wrap up our treatment of polyatomic gases.